distributed ledger technologies like blockchain and, and similar applications, things like Bitcoin and Ethereum, have been increasingly important recently. In this presentation, I'm going to look under the hood of those technologies, thinking about them not just in terms of you know, financial markets and things like that, but their wider applications in other domains, and especially in a domain like education. Why blockchain at all? Well, there have been various reasons put forward in the literature, trust, consensus, provenance, immutability, finality, uh, and some have even suggested equity. That's questionable at this point, but uh, maybe in the future. The idea here is that blockchain isn't just another kind of currency, and it isn't just another kind of way of storing data, but it's something that builds a system of providing the foundation for these things, financial systems, databases, etc., uh, that builds trust and consensus as a feature of the system rather than as a feature of the society and laws that surround that system. So let's look at some core concepts. One core concept, you'll see it a lot, is the idea of assets and ledgers. Now, uh, this is just terminology for, well, data. Uh, ledger contents can include things like transactions, P gives X to Q, or states, uh, P has N instances of an X, uh, or uh, A is a B, you know, spot is a dog, or even more interestingly, conditionals. Uh, for example, in a contract, right? If one transaction takes place, then execute the other transaction. Or inferences, if one state is the case, then another state must be the case. These are building blocks for some larger kinds of applications. Another aspect of this kind of technology is the idea of the distributed ledger. This is a system where we share information amongst each other. We don't trust one individual or each individual individually, but we do trust the group as a whole. And it's the interactions between the group as a whole that create the trust rather than our placing faith in a single individual. There are different kinds of distributed ledgers, different ways of storing data in a distributed fashion, and blockchain, different types of blockchain approach this differently. Another major underlying function is something called the cryptographic hash function. This is a, a mathematical algorithm, and what it does is it takes some arbitrary string data as input. For example, the red fox jumps over the blue dog, whatever. You run it through this function, it produces what's called here a digest. It could also be called a hash. And the idea here is that the hash function is a one-way function. So when you put the text in and produce the hash, that's the one way. But you can't go from the hash back to producing the text. That makes hashes hard to find, you know, the, the text corresponding to a hash hard to find. So there are technologies that can be built off of that fact. There are technologies that can also be built off of the uh, particular mathematical nature of the different hashing algorithms. Now, hash algorithms have developed over the years. Some of them are that from you know the 80s and 90s are now unsuitable. Some stronger ones like SHA-256, SHA-512 are more acceptable. Finally, we have the idea of the construction of a blockchain itself. And given what we've talked about, the construction of the blockchain is fairly straightforward. We have a, a bunch of transactions in each block, and they're at the bottom of our screen there. These transactions are hashed, and they, they actually build a tree of hashes. So you take each transaction, hash it, then take the hashes and hash them. That creates something called a Merkle tree. A Merkle tree is just a hash tree. So all of that taken together is a block. And you take the hash of that entire block and then you put it into the next block and the whole process starts again. So you can see 
each block contains the hash of the block before it. Because of this, you can't change any of the blocks without changing the entire chain. Because the hash for each one of these strings, each one of these transactions, is going to vary if you change the transaction. Change the transaction, you change the hash. So the idea of a blockchain is once the data is in the blockchain, it stays in the blockchain. You can't come along after and change it. This is a really powerful concept. This is very different from a traditional database where there's just a box where the data is and you actually go in, you edit that box and you change the contents of that box. The problem is once you've changed the contents of that box, you don't know what the old contents of that box were, which means if somebody comes in and changes it and it isn't detected, there's no way to fix that error. In a blockchain, obviously, you have a record. Every different transaction is added, nothing ever gets changed. Finally, there's the idea of consensus. And a consensus is what makes a blockchain more than just a fancy database. Remember, our, our blockchain is distributed. What that means in most cases is that we take our blockchain and each person in a network of participating nodes gets a copy of that blockchain. So everybody knows what the blockchain is. In this way, it's distributed. Now, what happens is you need to add new blocks to the blockchain in order to execute transactions. How do you make sure that this consensus holds across the entire network? Well, that's what the big innovation in Bitcoin was. Uh, it was something called proof of work. And specifically, it had to do with how the hashes were created to create the original blockchain. In that hash, you had to create a specific value that value was based on a mathematical computation involving the creation of the hash. And what's important here is that it's expensive to create, to create the hash, but it's cheap to verify the hash. So, because the idea is that you're trying to get a specific type of hash which means you have to try different values, you know, maybe iterate, choose randomly, whatever, in order to get that specific kind of hash. Once you have it, you found it, it's easy to test. But you know, you might have to run through hundreds or thousands of combinations before you find it. The reason why that produces consensus is that it means that this entire chain, if you want to fake a single transaction in this chain, you have to replace the whole chain. But because each block depends on this proof of work, this expensive calculation, you have to do these expensive calculations all over again to produce the new blockchain. In other words, it's more expensive to cheat in a blockchain like this than you would ever make from cheating the blockchain. And that's how the consensus is established. So let's look at a few applications of blockchain. So the obvious ones are in currency and financial. Uh, you know, payments, uh, Square for example, it's a little thing you put in your mobile phone to do credit card transactions. They're looking at uh, using uh, cryptographic financial exchanges. Gift cards like eGifter and Gift are, are doing Bitcoin implementations. Financial services are looking at using blockchains to replace a lot of the existing monetary instruments or, or to augment a lot of the existing monetary instruments. One of the biggest ones is crowdfunding where people raise money for a new enterprise by creating a new kind of digital currency and getting people to buy that digital currency. If the enterprise succeeds, the digital currency presumably will become valuable. Also in business, audit, compliance, laws and contracts, uh, I mentioned that some of the data we can store in a blockchain is uh, a contract, 
conditional kind of statements. So putting a contract into a blockchain is, first of all, not only is it something that you can't change after the fact, which is very useful, it's also something that once the conditions are satisfied, will execute automatically. So it's a self-fulfilling contract. Markets, for example, there's an example here I have uh, on this slide about using robots in the blockchain to pay coffee farmers fairly. That would be nice to see. Asset management, public blockchain for asset tracking. There you have, you know, if, if uh, an asset changes hands, you would have an exchange where each two people, each of the two people in the transaction would sign a record. They'd use digital signatures, sign a record, then add that to a blockchain. So we know the transaction is valid because we have two signatures on it and you can't deny it after the fact because it's in the blockchain. So it becomes very clear that yes, this transaction did take place. You can track the assets through time by these transactions. Similar application for shipping, uh, both you know parcels, but also like entire ships. Resources and industry are looking at applications as well. Uh, you know, in shipping, for example, uh, you know it has direct applications in agriculture. This uh, is an example on the slide here of uh, a blockchain being used to track an almond shipment. Forestry, uh, keeping track of the actual planting of trees. Uh, by forestry companies using blockchain. Mining, uh, one of the very common uh, case studies is using blockchain to track the provenance of diamonds to make sure that they're not conflict diamonds. And then of course, for distributed power creation and consumption, uh, you know, this is a classic case of you need to have a distributed database, but you have to have a database where all the different people in the database need to have reliable, trustworthy records. Government education and health, uh, major applications. Uh, governments are already testing some cryptocurrencies. Venezuela is one. Uh, there's an article that suggests Iran is another. I recently saw an article saying five countries are looking at this. It makes sense in a, in a lot of ways to have a cryptocurrency as your national currency. Uh, registries, land registry, uh, instead of depending on you know a single, often handwritten uh, land registry ledger where you have to actually go into the land registry's office to view it, um, having it on a blockchain means it's it's public and knowable. And if if a transaction happens, everybody can see. Oh yeah, that piece of land changed hands. Uh, shipping, as I mentioned before, Denmark's the first country to use blockchain technology to register register ships. Data, there's a, an example here, you see it on the screen. Um, uh, the NRC, where I work, uh, created a blockchain prototype. Uh, we put all of our IRAP grants that we give to uh, technology companies, we put the information about those on the blockchain. The reason why this is important is not, not simply because, yeah, we can do it, um, and not simply because it makes all this information public, although it does, uh, it means that the information is out there. The governments change, right? And a new government can't come along and simply remove all of this information from the website. It's out there, it's permanently and knowably out there. Same sort of technology can be used for things like medical records, health records, things like that, uh, educational records. All right. So the big thing about blockchain has always been the coins. And that's what everybody talks about. So let's talk about them a bit. The, uh, the first blockchain was Bitcoin. Uh, it's a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Uh, it's based on a white paper created by a person or a group or something called Satoshi Nakamoto. This is the one, as I mentioned, that uses proof of work as the method to establish consensus among the different partners uh, in the blockchain. Uh, currently, as of the creation of these slides, 115,000 nodes in the network, that's a lot. Each node connects to eight other nodes. So you can see how the transactions, you know, they, they propagate across the network. It's not that many steps to reach 115,000 nodes if each node is connected to eight, eight other nodes. Um, so 
Bitcoin registered transactions uh, as opposed to states. Uh, the big uh, criticism is that it's a bit slow. Well, it's a lot slow. So there's a, a technology called Lightning, and this is what they call a second level technology. And a way, a way to think of it is, well, you know, it's, it's kind of like a layer of blockchain on top of the blockchain, but I like to describe it in terms of using poker chips, right? So you have real cash, that's like Bitcoin, but you don't want to use real cash in a poker game for all kinds of reasons, right? Uh, it's just cumbersome among many other reasons. So when you go to a casino, what you do is you exchange your cash for chips. Chips are like lightning. It's the second level. Chips are easy to use. They're easy to work with. You can stack them, uh, put them on a table. And over. It's, it's very fast. Um, and, and you're not, you know, you're, you're not folding bills and all of that. So you do your thing, you, you go, you play poker or whatever with your chips. At any point, you decide to cash out, you take your chips, you go back to the cash, and you convert your chips into money, whatever's left of them. So that's how lightning works. Lightning is the poker chips of Bitcoin. Another major coin is Ethereum. Um, Ethereum, uh, well, they say, you know, if Bitcoin's the digital gold, Ethereum is the silicon. Ethereum, instead of recording transactions, it records states. And, and therefore, it can, can, it can record these conditional statements that I talked about. Uh, Ethereum is known not just for having coins, but for being able to have digital contracts recorded in the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, these contracts now can be self-executing contracts and as you get more complex contracts or more complex you know, inferences, you actually get decentralized applications. So an actual application can be on the Ethereum, uh, on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, a, a computer language called Solidity is a contract oriented programming language and it's used for writing these uh, smart contracts as they're called on various pla uh, blockchain platforms but especially ethereum and then the decentralized applications as i say they're called dApps. they can be everything from prediction markets to gaming to whatever uh, if you can think of an application you could probably make a dap for it so Ethereum is a very interesting and very complex kind of application. Uh, it takes, you know, the idea of Bitcoin to a whole new level. A third major class of applications characterized by Ripple and Stellar are applications that are not based on proof of work, but rather are based on either proof of authority or proof of state. Now that's a different kind of consensus mechanism. If you think about it, blockchain, the technology, would work perfectly well if you already trusted all of the nodes. You wouldn't need the proof of work because you know the nodes are trustworthy. Well, how do you know the nodes are trustworthy? Well, for one thing, they might actually be the authorities. Right? A government, for example, might uh, be the authority behind a blockchain. or they might be the stake involved. A bank, for example, could put up a large stake and basically bet its stake as a hedge against its being honest or at least not being caught being dishonest. And so the price of being dishonest is larger than anything you could get by being dishonest. And so that also guarantees uh, the trustworthiness of all the nodes in the blockchain. So anyhow, Ripple and Stellar are, are currencies that are based on this kind of concept. Ripple was created by a network of banks around the world and uh, they have this platform and it's a faster platform because you know it doesn't depend on proof of work. Uh, Payments, international payments can be processed in seconds rather than days. As such, it's a big an improvement 
all of our international financing applications now, such as SWIFT, for international money transfers. And so maybe down the line, we're looking at something like Ripple replacing international financial transaction systems. Stellar is like Ripple, um, except it's more decentralized, and this is something that IBM is working on. So those are just three or four of the major coins. There are, in fact, hundreds of coins, but they're all variants on those basic themes. Surrounding these coins is uh, an infrastructure of applications and services supporting our use of these. Uh, three of the major, uh, three of the major types of uh, infrastructure are exchanges, networks, and wallets. Uh, exchanges are places where you exchange one coin for another coin. Sounds really simple. It's hard in practice though. Um, because you know you're working with more than one blockchain at a time, they can also be places where you exchange you know actual cash for coins. Although generally the way it works is you buy Bitcoin or maybe Ethereum with your cash, and then you use Bitcoin or Ethereum to buy other coins. That's generally how it works. Two types of exchanges: centralized exchanges, Coinbase, Binance, for example, uh, which you know, kind of rubs the decentralized people the wrong way. So there are decentralized exchanges as well, such as Altcoin or IDEX. Um, and that, that is, honestly, I don't know how they work, um, but basically it's the same concept as decentralized uh, ledgers, only it's decentralized exchanges. Uh, and toward that you have networks of interoperable blockchain systems and there's been some work in that area so that it doesn't really matter whether you're using Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever. Um, the idea is that these blockchain networks are all interoperable. This is obviously in the early stage of development. Finally, there are wallets. A wallet is, well, you might think of the wallet is where you keep your money, but of course your money is on the blockchain. What the wallet is, is the digital ID that you have that you use to access that money that's on the blockchain. Uh, each, bit, each Bitcoin is associated with a digital address and very loosely. The, the digital address is the public key and your wallet is the private key, right? So the only way you can access your money is using your private key to make a transaction. You sign a transaction with your private key and then it executes with the public key and that's how you can buy something with Bitcoin. Works really well unless you lose uh, your key, <laughs> uh, which would be bad. Um, and it has happened, there's a lot of money, a lot of Bitcoin that's lost and probably will never be recovered. Um, and as well, there's always the risk of, you know, just forgetting. Um, so instead of just digital wallets, a lot of people are looking at actual physical wallets, which might be a USB key or something similar that you would create, you would secure, and it would have your identity on that key and you can't make a transaction unless you actually possess the key. And then you have a backup key just in case. All right, as well among the infrastructure are various platforms and services. I'm just gonna survey a few of them here. Again, this is a rapidly changing environment. Every day, new things are happening on it. So. Hyperledger Fabric is an example of a private business network. So it's, you know, it's a uh, distributed ledger blockchain kind of thing, but it's based on proof of authority rather than proof of work. So it's very fast, but it's not as distributed as a lot of people would like. But for many things, you know, like say, uh, 
you know, a shipping network where you know all the people in the network, uh, that might be fine. So they were, I think, pretty much the first off the mark with this enterprise level uh, distributed ledger application, but they're not alone. It's not on the slide anymore, or not on the slide, never was on the slide. Microsoft has come out with their own uh, uh, blockchain ledger technology for Azure. And then just this past week, uh, Amazon Web Services announced uh, what they call the Quantum Ledger Database, which again is has nothing to do with quantum computing. It has everything to do with distributed ledger technology. So these major, uh, you know, enterprise-focused ledgers now exist and, and now are out there marketing themselves. There are also platforms for building your own blockchain. Um, Arc is, is a platform that you can do for this. So it's a secure, secure platform designed for mass adoption, etc., etc. Uh, they call it the WordPress of crypto, and of course there's an Arc desktop wallet or a secure hardware wallet that goes with it. You use that as a platform, create your own currency, and then offer them for sale. No way that could be abused though. Um, Another framework, uh, this time for Ethereum, is called Truffle. So Truffle basically takes care of uh, managing your contract artifacts, you know, that solidity code so that you don't have to. Then uh, it uses something called Ganache to create what they call a one-click blockchain. And, there, and then a bunch of front-end libraries that make writing these user interfaces and writing these applications uh, more predictable. The example that I showed you earlier where NIC, NRC uh, put all of its IRAP transactions on a blockchain, that was written with Truffle. And related, it's not technically part of blockchain, but it's uh, you know, logically very similar, is inter interplanetary file system interplanetary linked data. It's basically the same kind of thing as a blockchain in many respects. Uh, the contents are uh, linked hashes of data. Uh, the nodes can store any kind of content. Um, that makes it a bit different from blockchain, but they're identifiable, the uh, individual contracts plus the individual blocks of data are uh, addressable according to the hash, so it's content addressable, just as content on the blockchain is content addressable. Um, and so there can be overlap between IPFS and uh, say Ethereum and blockchain. And uh, we looked at uh, uh, programs or, or projects that are in the works that would allow you to view uh, IPFS uh, data and a Solidity contract through the same interface or to allow you to use uh, Solidity, uh, a Solidity defined contract on Ethereum to reference some data in IPFS and if say some data in IPFS is created um, or applies in some way then the contract might be implemented. Now, all of this is not without issues, <laughs> to say the least, right? Um, and, uh, you know, like any technology, there are good points about it, there are bad points about it, there are risks, uh, and of course there are no guarantees necessarily. So I'm going to cover some of these before I wrap up. Uh, so first of all, is just the conceptual issue of blockchain. Um, one question is, where is the value in blockchain? Uh, is the value in the uh, consensus protocol itself, you know, the proof of work or proof of stake or whatever they come up with in the future? Uh, or is it in the uh, applications that are actually sitting on, um, you know, the blockchain like in Ethereum? Or is it, in the wallets or the end user applications that access the blockchain to manipulate data, 
but the real computational work, the real value happens at the end. It's not clear where, the, where this value lies, and so it's not clear where we need to focus our attention you know, on the one, you know, it's, in other words, it's not clear which part of this is infrastructure, which part of this is commodity, which part of this needs to be supported publicly, which part of this can be open for, you know, Wild West capitalist development. And, and that's an important conceptual question, you know, uh, do you want the underlying fundamental financial structure of the economy to be something that somebody is running for commercial gain? Uh, that's a serious question, and that's one of the conceptual issues that comes up with blockchain. As well, some of the mechanics uh, of blockchain uh, are can be called into question. Um, so th there are different kinds of things. Uh, economic incentives, the nothing at stake problem. These are ways in which a node could be a bad actor without penalty. Uh, there's a thing called the 50% plus one problem. Um, and there's a network right now, even as I speak, being attacked using the 50% plus one. That's where a single actor gains control over a majority of the nodes in a blockchain. Well, if you control all the nodes, you can reduce dramatically the cost of changing data, double spending uh, coins in the network. Um, so that's an issue. And then finally, there's what I call the joker problem. Uh, the joker problem is this. Uh, blockchain depends on economic incentives to, to keep it consistent, right? Remember I said that the cost of cheating the blockchain uh, when it's working properly is greater than anything you could gain by cheating the blockchain. But what if you don't care about that? What if, you know, all you want to do is see the world burn and you're willing to spend whatever it takes? That's a problem. Um, finally, immutability, the data once it's in there doesn't change. How does that square with the uh, general data protection regulation from Europe, which one of which is, one aspect of which is the right to be forgotten, the right to have data about yourself removed? But you can't remove data from an immutable blockchain. So what do you do? There's a bit of a conundrum there. People have talked about the cost of blockchain, the energy consumption now uh, to power Bitcoin, for example, is more than the energy consumption in some small countries. Uh, Bitcoin currently consumes the equivalent of 10% of Canada's en energy consumption, and that's a lot. Uh, and, you know, put more pragmatically, it costs 100 times, 100,000 times more to do a Bitcoin transaction than a Visa transaction. Now, of course, we, the consumers, pay a lot for a Visa transaction, so, but Visa itself does it very cheaply. And, and that's where that difference comes in. And then there's the scaling, right? How many transactions per second can you do? Bitcoin, seven transactions a second. As compared to Visa, does 24,000 transactions per second. That's a pretty big difference. There's also social and ethical issues. I raised the question at the start um, whether blockchain really does bring about equity. Uh, I read an article just yesterday saying that 20% of all of the uh, tokens in Ethereum are in the hands of what they call whales, or very large players, very large you know, owners of massive numbers of uh, tokens. Uh, that's not equity. Uh, and you know, the, these systems were set up so that the early movers in these systems, and they're all set up this way, the, the early movers in the systems can produce blocks very cheaply and very quickly and then these blocks become very valuable and they make a lot of them. Um, you know, there's, in, in the case of Bitcoin, um, the Satoshi Nakamoto blocks have never been spent. And that's a lot of blocks. Um, and again, the question is, you know, what happens if somebody starts, you know, what happens if even one of those coins is spent? 
blockchain as well, you know, it's, you know, I mean, it's completely distributed. There's no control. It's a, a network of self-interested players. That's classic libertarianism. Uh, it's also setting us up for market failures. It's setting us up for vast swings in prices. Uh, you know, and you, you know, it's like uh, Uber had surge pricing. Bitcoin can have surge pricing, but if it ever did, nobody could ever turn it off because it's completely decentralized. There's also been a lot of scams and fraud and other things uh, with uh, uh, digital currencies. Of course, the same is true of uh, real currencies, we'll call them. Um, there, these scams take place not in the blockchain itself, which, which itself is a pretty secure, secure technology, but these companies have been so fast and loose setting themselves up that the wallets can be hacked. Uh, there are things uh, where people are able to steal people's private keys in order to access the, the uh, Bitcoins. Uh, again, I read a case just yesterday where somebody, where was it, India? Somewhere, um, was kidnapped and drugged and tortured in order to reveal his Bitcoin key. Uh, you know, so the, these are all also issues uh, involving um, blockchain and distributed ledger technology generally. You know, and it's, it is the issue of, you know, these things are, you know, beyond the design of the system, these things are not controlled. And because they're not controlled, then within the scope of the system that was designed, anything goes and nobody can stop it. And so nobody can stop it inside the system. And so the only mechanism really is to exert control from outside the system. But it's not clear how to do that yet. Uh, you know, a classic example, how do you tax profits that were made uh, in Bitcoin transactions? You know, if you don't know the identity of the person who made the transaction, things like that. So that basically is it. Um, I wanted to talk about all of these issues. Uh, obviously, they, they play a major role in uh, our topic in e-learning 3.0 and distributed learning technology. But I think they also play a wider role in society generally. Uh, the unit that I'm discussing blockchain in is called community. Um, and in that unit, I said that community is consensus and that the way we define a community is the way that community reaches consensus. Uh, some communities uh, define consensus by proof of work. Other communities define consensus by proof of authority. Uh, other communities define uh, consensus by proof of stake. And, you know, once you start beginning of thinking of community as consensus, and you think of the different ways you can create consensus, some centralized, others decentralized, uh, it gives you a different kind of perspective on what community actually is. It's an alternative model of community. I mean, most models of community are based on sameness. They're based on the idea that everybody is working toward the same end, that there's a shared vocabulary, a shared culture, etc. None of this is true of a decentralized ledger network, right? Uh, the only thing that connects all of these individuals is a small bit of code that defines how the transactions will be conducted among them. And otherwise, anything else goes, right? It's a pretty minimal system. You can build more maximal systems, and you know you, you can build ledger systems or information systems, etc., with more or fewer controls on it. And how you do that defines the kind of community that you're going to have. And I think it's important that we recognize this as a way we describe community because I have another thing 
that relates to the idea of community as consensus, and that's this. Fake news is, to my mind, a consensus problem. Uh, we're not talking about who owns a certain coin, but we're talking about do we recognize a certain statement as true? Now, if you think of truth as the coin of a community, and uh, that's pushing the analogy a bit, but, but bear with me. Think of truth as the coin of a community. How do we allocate these coins? How do we determine what's true and what's not true? Or if you don't like truth, how about what we're willing to accept and what we're not willing to accept as a community, right? And maybe it's voting, but there are lots of issues with voting. Um, maybe we can have a mechanism where only the people who are impacted by this um, really need to have a say on this. Maybe truth really is very localized and, you know, just like some coins are localized and the only people who really matter are the people who are involved in that transaction. That's a lot like what Pete Forsyth was describing with Wikipedia. So we have two things happening here, right? We have this really interesting set of technologies, a lot of which we've covered in our course. Uh, some of which have to do with identity, distributed data, uh, cryptography, etc. And on the other hand, things that have to do with community formation, knowledge, learning, even justice. Uh, and, and these two things go hand in hand. And in a learning environment, both of these things are at play, and they're both at play in new ways that we've never seen in learning before. Uh, and that's why I called this course eLearning 3.0, because you take these concepts, you put them together, and you try to do learning with them, and you really have created something new. So uh, that's the uh, blockchain talk with a little extra at the end. I'm Stephen Downs. This is eLearning 3.0. Thank you uh, for listening, and I'll talk to you again.